Hello, everybody. I'm Gillian Maxwell. I'm a founding board member of the Psychedelic Association of Canada, which you may also know as the uh, Canadian Psychedelic Association. We're changing our name slightly. Um, and uh, I'm welcoming you to uh, our third uh, wonderful event looking at legal issues and the legal pathways to access to psychedelics in Canada. I'm um, just tell you a little bit about me. I've uh, been involved in harm reduction and drug policy reform for over 20 years. And, um, and I'm pretty excited at being alive actually at this time and being around for these amazing, I think, opportunities that are coming our way with, um, with all the things that are going on in the world, the, all the difficult things that, that are balanced by the great things. And we're gonna talk about some great things this evening or wherever you are this, this, this afternoon. Um, so that's me. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the Psychedelic Association later. But right now I'm going to ask uh, each of our illustrious legal panel to introduce themselves and let's start with Rob. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Laurie. I'm the principal founder, barrister solicitor with Adlusum Law Corporation. I do um, high profile cases involving plant medicines and cannabis. I spend most of my time these days providing regulatory consulting, litigation, and other strategic advisory in addition to a very busy legal practice. So yeah, very honored to be here today and thank you for uh, hosting the third installment of uh, Le Pathways to Legalization. Thank you, Rob. How about you, Jennifer? Who are you? You're on mute. Sorry. Hi, I'm Jennifer Tobe. Uh, wonderful to have the opportunity to speak to everybody again and chat with my colleagues. Um, I'm based in Vancouver and I practice in the regulatory and policy side of cannabis and drug law. Beautiful. Thank you. And David. My name is David Wood. <clears throat> I'm a lawyer and patent agent. Uh, before I went to law school, I completed a PhD in biochemistry. I'm currently chief legal officer and general counsel at SciGen Industries Limited, which is a contract manufacturer for psychedelics <clears throat> for use in clinical trials. And I also uh, run my own legal practice uh, called R Group Legal, that where I my practice is exclusively focused on intellectual property and regulatory and commercial law in psychedelics and in cannabis. Thank you very much, David. So as you can see, we have a lot of depth and experience here represented here. Um, and a couple of things I just want to say about the Psychedelic Association um, is, uh, sorry, I just got dinged with something that doesn't make sense to me, so I'm going to carry on, um, is that uh, we're an association that's community built and led. And we are very interested in your input and we're very interested in, in what you think. And we're very interested in having you join us as members because we represent people across Canada and we really need that input in order to um, be uh, credible and also to know what's going on. So please consider joining the Psychedelic Association of Canada. And um, in particular, we have, oh, so many amazing and wonderful volunteers who give a lot of their time um, just volunteering their time to make uh, many, many things work. Like, for instance, this webinar this afternoon, we have two volunteers here uh, who are just giving their time in to do all the technical background stuff. And so that leads, leads our um, staff. We have an executive director and a um, Deanna is, I guess she just makes everything work. I'm not quite sure what her title is, but Deanna's really in charge. And um, and it leaves, it frees them up to do uh, other work that's sort of coordinating work that's so important. So please consider joining us as a member. Um, and thank you all our amazing volunteers. So a couple of things I just wanted to say before we get launched. We do actually have some questions from last time. Um, you may have noticed if you've been on these before that everybody has an opinion because they're lawyers and they all like to talk about their opinions, which is why we have them here. So we don't always get to cover all the um, 
all the questions. And so we've brought a few over from last time, which we'll start with. Uh, and I just wanted to say, also make a statement about um, this pretty exciting thing that we've been working on. Um, it's called the, it's really a terribly dry and boring title, the Memorandum of Regulatory Access, which uh, we also refer to as MORA. M-O-R-A. So I'm just going to read you a little piece that we wrote today just to tell you what's going on. So the Psychedelic Association is excited to report that we're preparing for a meeting with Health Canada in November, and we're, ho we're not going to be talking about more or, or make any comments about what we submitted until after we've spoken then, to them to understand their needs so that we can expand on the tremendous work that has been completed by the legal, medical, and community experts that have made this document possible. We will not be discussing it this evening. We need to you know, uh, leave that for meeting them, uh, but look forward to engaging you, the public, in the very near future to share more updates on our progress and gain more community feedback. And just in talking about that before we went live uh, this evening, um, <laughs> Deanna again, our trusty, amazing, the person in charge um, said, you know, guys, what is the difference? Uh, can you tell, is there a difference uh, between Section 56 and the Special Access Program? Well, everybody said, of course, there's a difference. And so we thought we'd start with defining it. So who would like to start with their version of the difference between Special Access Program and Section 56 and exemptions? Uh, I I can if uh, so. Subsection fifty six one is a very broad, very general power that the Minister of Health has under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. A subsection fifty six one exemption can be issued for <clears throat> any controlled substance. So that could be a restricted drug, a controlled drug, a narcotic, or a targeted substance. There's four types of controlled substances in Canada. And a subsection 56-1 exemption can be issued for any of them. And they're typically limited in scope. They're typically very specific for a specific task, such as research in a university. So if one wanted to study the toxicology of a controlled substance, they could ask for a subsection 56-1 exemption to source some from a licensed dealer or import it from the equivalent of a licensed dealer in another country. And then they would have a certain defined amount of a certain substance or substances, and those would be used for a purpose defined in the subsection 56-1 exemption, such as feeding them to human tissue culture or, or animals and checking what happens. And uh, then you, you would source that controlled substance as per the exemption, and then whatever wasn't used in the experiment would be destroyed. And, and that's the end of it. And, and they typically involve, they do not involve creating controlled substances. They don't typically involve cultivating organisms or synthesizing drugs. They involve receiving them from somewhere else. And they typically do not allow the substance to be conveyed to anybody else. Now, that's a scientific research exemption, which is the most common kind. Uh, research, exemptions have been given to <clears throat> patients for using psilocybin to possess and to use the psilocybin. None of the exemptions I'm aware of have named a source for any of those people. Uh, similar exemptions have been issued to healthcare practitioners. And based on some data I saw, there are a very large number of those exemptions in the queue at Health Canada. Those have all been focused on psilocybin. <clears throat> but again, an exemption can be for any substance. And I, I believe uh, Jennifer might know more about this, but I believe ayahuasca as the harmaline and DMT, the two drugs in ayahuasca, have been allowed to at least one religious group under an exemption. But I, my knowledge on that topic is a bit thin, so I'll let Jennifer talk about that. Special access program is under Part C of the Food and Drug Regulations. Part C of the Food and Drug Regulations are regulations under the Food and Drugs Act, not under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. So they're aimed at Part C of the Food and Drug, and by the way, incidentally, Part G and Part F, or sorry, J, of the con Food and Drug Regulations are under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, uh, which, you know, is a little counterintuitive for people, but it's it 
that's well, that'll come up later. But under Part C of the Food and Drug Regulations, drug products like you know acetaminophen under the name Tylenol, for example, would be regulated under Part C. Part C puts rules for drug products, like they have to have a drug identification number to be saleable. That's a product specific regulatory approval. And they have to be manufactured in accordance with good manufacturing practices at a facility that has a drug establishment license. None of those things are specific to controlled substances. They could be, like if you think of morphine tablets for pain relief, that's a controlled substance. It is a drug product. It's sold to people under prescription, of course. The special access programs under Part C of the Food and Drug Regulations, and it allows a physician to apply to Health Canada with a 24-hour service standard to receive special access to a drug that in Canada doesn't have a drug identification number, doesn't have a DIN, it's not approved in Canada. However, to have a realistic chance of getting special access to a drug, it should probably be in phase three or already approved for sale in another country. So I'd say the special access program is much narrower in scope than an exemption. An exemption can be whatever the Minister of Health decides is appropriate. Special access is only issued in normal circumstances, and I take that to mean in any circumstances, for drug products that are almost approved in Canada, almost approved somewhere else, or already approved somewhere else. They have a much faster turnaround, and they're an application by a physician. The last thing I'd say, and I think everyone here knows this, is that restricted drugs, which is one of the four types of controlled substance, are ineligible for the special access program. That might change. I have no idea if it will or not. Restricted drugs include all the drugs everyone on this webinar is thinking about right now. LSD, MDMA, psilocybin, DMT, 2CD, mescaline, those kind of drugs are restricted and not available in the special access program. Thank you, David. Um, I actually thought we'd made a big effort to change that last part, to remove all of those from the restricted list. Did that no, not go anywhere? No, what, what, what happened is you had the Portland Hotel Society, I believe. No, Providence Healthcare. And it was the Providence case where they wanted to treat heroin addiction with heroin, funny enough. And the Harper government under Rona Ambrose when she was health minister, and this is just to we can conclude SAP with this footnote, it was the conservative government that took many of the substances that are now restricted drugs and put them on the restricted drug list, including heroin. And so in the Providence case, they ended up suing and effectively getting an exemption and heroin under those circumstances is is permissible. Um, but the the caveat is is that it doesn't require a you know big hubbub with a vote in parliament. The the SAP could be amended through a order in council, which our Prime Minister Justin Tofino, I mean Trudeau, uh, would be able to do that overnight if he should so have desired. So ultimately, the conservatives took the goodies off and put them in the the in this this the out of the SAP. Trudeau could bring that back tomorrow, and I guess the question is why the delay, why haven't they, or why the difficulties? So that's SAP. Pretty clear. Thanks, Rob. How about you, Jennifer? Do you want to talk about? Um... I mean, there is a legislative. Uh, or a regulatory proposal to um, to remove the restriction for Part G uh, substances. Uh, it's just still in the works, as I believe my colleagues are probably aware of. Yeah. Do you want to say anything um, about ayahuasca? Well, <sighs> David thought. You I mean, one of my interests, of course, has been the access to. Uh, psychedelic substances for spiritual or religious purposes. And we do have exemptions in Canada already. One of them is, is the Santo Daime Church. 
Uh, and uh, they went through uh, years of effort in order to uh, document their uh, the usage and protocols for uh, usage, as well as the where they even access their medication. So, or their their what's the uh, I forget the word of uh, for um, sacrament. Their sacrament. Sorry. <laughs> um, with regards to Section 56, I, the S, sorry, with regards to psychedelics, other than molecules such as MDMA, um, it really is not what I think Health Canada is uh, planning. They are, are they are not going to be looking at uh, mushrooms under the SAP program. They're looking at it under Section 56, like they did with cannabis. Um, and I think that if my, on my best guess that they are working on protocols that will streamline access to psilocybin under section 56, and hopefully that will be done, uh, or accomplished through efforts like, uh, can, uh, the psychedelic association of Canada, uh, and other groups like Theracil. Uh, and hopefully within the next year, and until we um, get those uh, policy directives uh, with regards to how they want to roll out the application forms and what they they want in the applications, it's, I think we're going to have things at a standstill as uh, um, litigation such as the Theracil um, uh, mandamus applications uh, work their way through the courts. Does that? It's pretty clear. Any other comments before I move on to something else? Well, they didn't know what the SAP and special access or section. They certainly aren't going to know what mandamus is. That probably should be clarified. Mandamus is one of the like ancient prerogative writs. You've got certiorari, mandamus, injunctive, injunctio, which is like injunctive relief. And David, help me. What's the fourth prerogative writ? But ultimately, these are instances of the common law, which are still very much uh, in in use today. So, yeah, an application of mandamus is effectively you're going to the court and asking them for effectively a mandate or a ruling on a position. Um, and I think what's interesting is that when I was working with Theracil, they had an opportunity where the government hadn't made any decisions one way or another. There wasn't the exemptions that were made in August. So you effectively had a scenario, which is an ideal perfect storm for charter litigation, which has slowly <clears throat> eroded to some extent, because at that point, when you, with an absolute prohibition, it's harder for the government to justify um, not granting any access. So you think about a door being welded or closed shut for no good reason. However, by allowing or ending the litigation to collaborate with the government, um, what that effectively has done is now that door which was shut is now open a crack. That crack, although it's maybe a game of inches, it's actually a universe of difference in terms of what a court may look at in terms of deference to be given the government of the day. And so when you have a position that's really high up on the, the mountain of an absolute prohibition, and yet you slide a little further back down the side of the mountain to where, okay, government have exercised authority and deference, your grounds to make arguments about delay or the turnaround time with processing applications, you know, you've got government that will err on the side in any of these mandamus rulings to say, well, government is allowed to make an error. They just can't make an error beyond their jurisdiction so as to have their decision struck down under regulatory principles. And so for me, as excited as I am to see how this makes it through the process, I just see it as being more difficult because, again, government are allowed to legislate 
And we're in a position where, not to touch on Mora, but we're in a position where really the government is now forced to look at what do we do? Do we slowly start making changes with groups that are operating at the clinical trials, scientific levels or the protocols? Or do we delay and adjourn the criminal prosecution of these activities? And the interesting thing is you're not seeing law enforcement take the attention to these activities on the black side or even the gray side of the line due to mandates and other reasons. So I think there's there's a concern that I have to, again, looking at it from we can work with government, we'll figure it out, is what will happen sooner or later is somebody not nearly as organized without the science, but will have a pretty good case for medical access of which they will be able to point to that. And I think that will open doors and open dams a lot quicker than trying to work with a government that they know if they were to regulate this tomorrow, they know that they're now venturing into cannabis territory, which, to be honest, they don't want to go anywhere near that. <laughs> if they start granting more and more access, which is where we're getting into that slippery slope with the, the any kind of regulated access, now just means that how are they going to do that without creating a hundred more problems for, for, for one you're trying to solve. And let's not forget, unlike cannabis in the Pacific Northwest, at least, these Part J substances are grown out in the woods. So at the end of the day, sooner or later, someone in a perfect case, right, whether, and you know, whether it's adult use or not, these issues will be challenged and they're not being challenged quick enough. And will they be challenged? So we're in this really interesting doldrum where the tale of two cities are playing out and are either winning. Go for so it, I'm, I'm just going to jump in here. So basically a mandamus is a application of federal court and uh, the applicant who's a uh, who has submitted their application to Health Canada for a section a subsection 561 exemption to access psilocybin uh, for uh, uh, end of life purposes in in most of the cases, uh, and the their the application is specifically in, to force Health Canada to make a decision, and um, and yeah. the question is really what is an acceptable delay. Uh, in my books, there isn't an acceptable delay. I'm just Patient. having you. Um, are you going to say something, Rob? Oh, treatment. What do they say over at Therosil? Treatment delayed is treatment denied. And yeah, that yeah. and such is an injustice. Yeah, exactly. Um, talking about that door, that door being cracked open, you've reminded me I spent oh, over 10 years working with keeping the door open. That was the name of our group, Dialogues on Drug Use. And we're still pushing that door, just trying to keep it open. Uh, I have a question here from Justin Arcaro. Um, I don't think we touched on this particular piece, and then we'll move on. Uh, out of curiosity, do we know why the proposed changes to the special access program back in December when they sought public feedback? I'd forgotten about that. That seems like that was December, my God. And everybody wrote in, have not been officially made yet. Is it just a matter of time or has something happened? Any Anybody got any intel on that? I don't, Did they just ignore yeah. all of those people? I think they're that buying in? time. Huh? They're buying time until right. somebody forces their hand. Yeah. But they asked for the feedback. They asked. That, that's a different thing, though. I, I think that that proposed amendment was made because there's one company that's MAPS Public Benefit Corporation that's very close to having an MDMA drug product. And then there's two companies. Compass Pathways and USONA Institute that are quite far along on psilocybin and many companies with various regulatory strategies to either beat them there or be there very quickly afterwards. Many companies. I think Health Canada is conscious of that and just sees for the first time that there are restricted drugs that might realistically be eligible for special access because right today there's zero. 
but these other substances were eligible, right? And it was a political decision to take them from that. Because again, a special access requires a doctor to effectively consider eight factual considerations because they're putting their, their practice on the line yeah. that they've exhausted treatments but, and so on. And, um, you know, from <clears throat> my understanding, MDMA and I believe LSD and others were technically on that, for, but they were taken off along with heroin. Now, heroin yeah, was no, definitely no. on that, but I don't know the story with the <clears throat> others. Heroin used to be a narcotic and became a restricted drug. Because the and it's not certain restricted drugs; it's all of them. Like, uh, you know, pick one: harmine, harmaline. Those are restricted drugs. Diethyl tryptamine is a restricted drug. None of those are available through special access either. You know, that probably no one's proposing a medical use of diethyl tryptamine, but if they are, it can't be through the special access program uh, because it's a restricted drug. If we <clears throat> remove the exclusion from part C of the food and drug regulations to make special access apply to restricted drugs, then it'll still, now this isn't in the law, but you know, health Canada themselves, like there was a webinar that tons of people were on in late July, health Canada, you know, in plain language showed that they're the way they apply this, the way they interpret and apply the law. It's not an unreasonable one at all is that, you know, drugs should be late stage clinical trial or allowed in other countries to be eligible. So again, I, I, I don't know what the delay is. I mean, I think, you know, health Canada is probably thinking about other stuff right now. Right. And, uh, you know, I think the priority that's, that's there for their bandwidth is probably pretty focused on the pandemic, but, uh, so I, I'm I'm assuming it's something like that. And it's also not Health Canada that changes that. It's the legislature or whoever mm -hmm. makes the order in council. And mm -hmm. I just think there's different priorities than we maybe thought there would be in December when maybe we thought things would be a little, little different than they are now. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think, so it's that and, and is, I think, the cause for the delay. But I, I really think people overstate the breadth of this. I, I think it's there so that those two drug products, well, sorry, drug products, including either MDMA or psilocybin. And I don't mean a pile of MDMA crystals or a bag of mushrooms. I mean, a press tablet formulated exactly the way Maps or Compass or Usona formulates their product made by those companies, the same products that are being used in clinical trials. Okay. Well, thank you. That's, uh, that's actually pretty clear. Health Canada has a lot to consider. And uh, just another um, comment about the Association of um, Psychedelic Association of Canada is um, we, as I said earlier, will be at the table with Health Canada and we're, we're very honoured to be invited. Um, and our membership actually and how many members we have actually makes a difference to when we go and speak to them with uh, telling them who we represent and how many people we represent. So don't forget to join if you're not a member of the association. And before we continue on to another political question, I just want to acknowledge that we are joining you from the traditional territories of Musqueam and Squamish and to uh, slay Watooth peoples. Um, just wanted to acknowledge that and I over, it was an oversight of mine as we started, so. Thank you very much. Now we're still going to do the politics. In fact, this is all politics really in the end, but this is the capital P and we're going to just talk about the federal election for a second and um, nothing really changed as we know uh, much, but uh, during the election, we asked all the major federal parties whether they would support legalizing psilocybin assisted therapy. Uh, the liberal party said it would follow the guidance of health experts on this issue. And the NDP said it would support safe and equitable patient access to psychedelic therapy in Canada. Um, so now with the number of seats everybody has, the, the possibility is that those two parties have the requisite number of votes to pass legislation, allowing greater access to psychedelic therapy in Canada. What do you think, guys? Would that happen? What, what, would, what would make that happen? Is it actually gonna happen? I mean, 
I've stopped really betting in either direction. It wouldn't surprise me if it did. It wouldn't surprise me if it didn't. Um, I'm, you know, we don't need to get into a, a discussion about the differences, but uh, Theracil has also submitted proposed medical access regulations to Health Canada. My hope is that theirs or the Mora, or probably an evolution of both of them, gets turned into law, that we do have a way to create a, a supply chain for regulated products that are safe and that are of known potency and, and that are, you know, manufactured and, and whether this is synthetic material or dried fruiting bodies or, or anything else, the, the way it's manufactured is that, uh, it's, it's to standards, much like a cannabis product. And, uh, as long as that system exists, then you can have someone who gives access like a healthcare practitioner. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think it could, we've done it with cannabis and, uh, this would be, I think a little different because it's probably for the most part going to be used differently. It'll probably be a lot easier for data to be acquired as this is rolled out than it was with cannabis. And it'll, you know, I think, I think in a lot of ways, it'll be easier to manage. Um, and, and, but as far as whether it happens, I mean, that's, uh, again, it wouldn't surprise me in either direction, right? Like it's, uh, there's a lot of work being done under the law as it currently is. And I feel that better access for everybody, um, especially when you consider the cost of some of these therapies will probably happen if we do have medical access. And when I say medical access, I mean, outside of the pharmaceutical system, but, uh, you know, it, there will be drug products with psychedelics as active ingredients, including psilocybin. So, you know, I think probably there's a, a consideration to be made there. If it's better for Canada to also have a parallel system that has nothing to do with per se pharmaceuticals, which is medical use. I mean, I think that's kind of the philosophical decision here. And, and, and I think uh, particularly post pandemic or whatever during the pandemic, during endemic COVID, I think we're going to have a lot more people with mental health issues than we had two years ago. And I think there's less money to help mm -hmm. them. So to me, the responsible thing, which is a medical access system, is the responsible choice fiscally and practically because it's going to provide access to people at a lower cost than if it has to be pharmaceuticals. And that's not to say there isn't a role for pharmaceuticals. Like they're simpler. You can prescribe them. They're insurable. It's, it fits in the system better. So I, I think with both options, Canada does better than without medical access. Jennifer? You're on mute, honey. Sorry. So really, it's keep moving forward. We have a strong minority government. Uh, and we have the same bureaucrats at Health Canada and the Privy Council that are trying to digest the impact and the policy that they want to unroll uh, with regards to psychedelics. And it may also be that they're digesting and trying to decide the impact of decriminalization as well for uh, street drugs. And uh, uh, really, so. it's we we have another issue of use-based need, just like cannabis. And they, the Health Canada and Privy Council have to decide how they want to, to handle it. And it takes time for bureaucracy to uh, move through those steps. And once again, uh, at, and this has been some of the questioning is how can people help is uh, do work with organizations like the, the Psychedelic Association of Canada or other groups that are advocating for uh, decriminalization and legalization. And uh, really uh, public interest 
uh, and advocacy is what will move things forward. Ron? Well, I have a very different view of government. I, I work with them, but I have the scars to prove what it's like to engage with government on a regular basis. And the reality is, is I have clients that certainly aren't waiting to do anything legal. I work with a lot of First Nations that are jumping all over this opportunity as they are with cannabis. So I'm looking at a lot of sovereign arguments. And it's interesting because you can come up with whatever legal system you want, but there is a concerted effort of coordination with First Nations. And I mean, they're taking a page out of my playbook, which is peg the price of cannabis at two bucks, right? Enter into long-term supply and energy contact agreements with energy authorities that none of my friends or companies would be eligible for. And guess what? You will force the market into a position which actually reflects the price of a commodity that prior to the 1936 Marijuana Stamp Act was 37 cents a pound. And they sure were not cultivating the THC out of the Indian hemp weed, as it was known at that time. So where does that leave us with the election? Well, I was quite hopeful that Trudeau would have secured a majority. Had that majority happened, then any of these initiatives that are being tabled, I think would have a snowball's chance in hell, which is a good chance with government. The difficulty though is, is Trudeau is now in a minority situation. The brand of the liberal government has been really impacted. So any group bringing in, for example, a fringe topic, as much as I'd love to see it, um, they're looking at what could the political blowback be. And to me, this is the difficulty that you can beg and plead and try to negotiate and best efforts, but the legacy with cannabis, unfortunately, and any other restricted or controlled drug, right, going back to safe injection sites and Van Du and the legacy that Jillian has led the way being a part of, Ultimately, that required frog marching, the federal and provincial, and sometimes you have support of the provincial and the municipal government, but generally it means frog marching the federal government towards a line of what reasonable, dignified patient access looks like. And in the case of cannabis, where, you know, look, it was like a dam, but now the dam is broken, that there's cannabis proliferation on both sides of the line and in the least the world that I live in there's no shortage of really any supply of plant medicines that to do with my mushrooms or mycology or mycelium I mean there is a ridiculous amount and so what this really comes back to is the issues that politicians and that we have to coordinate is these were all bad laws that were brought effectively with the United States leading the way. And until the international rules are changed, you're really going to have the standstill where the black market thrives, provided they pay their taxes. But the, the good guys or the regulated market is going to continue to be like sliced six ways from Sunday by tax, government, accounting, banking, financial regulation. And so tying that back into our governments, whether it's the NDP, liberals, conservatives, this is the concern they have with cannabis and they're going to have with psychedelics or any of these is they do not want to burn bridges internationally. That means there's halts on the Canadian financial system. So really anything other than medical access or scientific yes. research are, are the avenues that we're stuck with until dramatic um, changes happen. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah. I mean, that's why it makes sense if you're going to provide access to psilocybin, that it be a system under the controlled drugs and substances act that is consistent with our UN obligations, because then as long as you're not touching the controlled drugs and substances act, as long as psilocybin remains a controlled substance, and as long as access to it is 
medical or scientific only, as Rob pointed out. If you, if you read the Cannabis Act, you'll notice that all the import-export is limited to A, industrial hemp, B, medical, or C, scientific. Psilocybin, if the law changes at all, my prediction is that it'll be very similar. It'll be medical only. And that's actually a very good thing because it's that way Canada stays consistent with respect to psilocybin. We're certainly not consistent with respect to cannabis, but I think that's a good thing with the RUN obligations. So I think that by walking into this stepwise, we're not going to cause international problems. I mean, I don't think anyone outside of Canada is going to care if we start selling psilocybin to people when they have a medical reason to have it. And then now we are also, Rob mentioned the United States led drug prohibition. The United States also led drug not prohibition, right? Like California, and, and, but that not the United States, individual states did. California, on my understanding, had the first medical cannabis program starting in 1996. Don't quote me on that. I remembering something Joe Rogan said. Um, so, and then we all know that Colorado went adult use legal in 2014 and so did Washington state. And, uh, so perhaps now that we're already seeing Oregon setting up a regulated market and California, Washington state, and I believe Vermont, and, and I recently read another Eastern seaboard state that was looking at decriminalizing psilocybin and other in in the case of washington and again i'm a bit fuzzy on this i think it's most plants i think i might be wrong there um oregon in addition to the regulated psilocybin market is has legislation that's proposed and maybe even passed to decriminalize plants in general and in california they've named a few different drugs specific drugs some of which are not naturally sourced that will no longer be uh, criminally prohibited to possess and that you're allowed to share with people. And the implications of allowing sharing are, are significant, actually. If you, that actually might allow some sort of businesses that would be federally non-compliant, but to exist. So I think if Canada were to allow people one controlled substance called psilocybin, and I guess by extension psilocin, because there's going to be psilocin in the mushroom as well to some extent, if we're going to allow people to have that medically, maybe the when the U.S. has a significant percentage of its population able to access these substances, perhaps even outside of medically, you know, we could see things change geopolitically in a way that allows even more progress you towards to re- undoing. The only caveat which I needed to add, though, is the U.S., sure, but you have the federal level. So I've got clients yeah. and friends in California that are dealing with tax issues big time with the federal Absolutely. government. But I, I'm just ultimately about under how, international yeah. law, like the U.S. government. But the thing that I see, and I mean, this is my undergrad coming back here, the 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 Security Council, of which China and Russia have lifetime appointment and veto. Right. The U.S. might be able to say, hey, we'll change these uh, rules as they apply. But I can't see how China and Russia. Right. Again, uh, at the Security Council level or which and also at the General Assembly level are going to welcome anytime soon psychoactive mind expanding consciousness substances in any form due to let's just take how China views Falun Gong and meditation. So I think. Again, there's this really thorny issues and the only way out that maybe, you know, and even Canada's for rec with cannabis is still illegal technically. But the medical side um, with respect to banking and accounting, David shaking his head, which is ultimately an issue where commercial cannabis companies are still having issues with audits, for example. They get audited if there's something like loose in their supply chain, then they have to effectively, the central bank turfs them by virtue of losing their greater privileges. And so that, the letter of the law is where that has to be remedied. But for that to be remedied is, you know, at the international level has to be led by the US, but you can see my point. 
that will only potentially go so far. And where does that leave us? Yeah, I mean, that's the only point I was making is that the U.S. might change the way they see this faster than with cannabis. Just like in Canada, I think we're going to see this get to whatever destination it's going to reach a lot faster than the arc we saw with cannabis. The destination just might be different. I agree, actually, because I look at what I see in the black market, the red market, all these markets um, effectively are pushing the tempo. And an interesting project that I've been involved in with a number of different First Nations groups is like they're prepared to like sail right into this issue because the fact of the matter, if you've got indigenous groups in the rainforests of the Amazon that have protections, for example, under Article 32.4, I believe it is, that's what ICERS relies upon, that gives Indigenous right to that. And I would love to see, right, a Canadian Indigenous group, preferably on the West Coast, right, My, or, or wherever, but to be able to make the argument for these international protections, whereby how we see um, national patrimony, as they call it in Peru, in Canada, because especially if we have UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which has been incorporated into law in British Columbia, that coupled with the efforts that the CPA and others are doing, you know, I think is going to, could, could actually speed things up in, in, in addition to the efforts that are being attempted in the courts. But either way, I think this is where Canada has to really stand up and say, hey, what rules will A, we accept, and what rules will we play by? Because again, Canada does have a reputation of, to some degree, setting a good example for other countries to consider. And well, if we're going to get this right, um, one thing we learned from cannabis was the need to include our Indigenous First Nations peoples and their views. And whether, whether it's acknowledged or not, um, the, what I, the efforts I'm seeing are tenfold more aggressive and ambitious than what I saw with cannabis. And so, again, I think the government doesn't know what to do because either way, you know, they make a move left or right or up or down. Everyone will adjust accordingly. And uh, where does that leave? So it's an interesting dilemma. It certainly is. I've got... Um... Uh, uh, another question, actually, which is uh, going to lead us into another um, uh, whole area. Jennifer, would you like to say something before we go? Sure. There? Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that, um, as Rob has suggested, it really is a social justice issue uh, worldwide. Yes. <laughs> um, and the WHO has uh, been advocating for traditional medicines for quite a few years. Uh, and because I think it's about 75% of the world population does not have access to pharmaceuticals. However, the advocacy for traditional medicines is silent on the fact that there are uh, traditional medicines that contain controlled psychoactive substances. But that I believe worldwide is uh, is an issue that's ongoing. It's it's a dialogue amongst. Uh, many advocates, and um, I do believe that uh, uh, Indigenous uh, peoples in Canada should should also be uh, trying to further those efforts. Uh, yeah, I agree. It's a massive opportunity, actually. Um, and um, we do have an Indigenous uh, board member, and then actually we developed the whole Indigenous co um, um, uh, committee. Um, and we're in conversation with them constantly. And so that is a very good point, uh, Jennifer, that we will uh, pass on to them. Thank you. Um, and just to really close off just what we have been talking to, I'm just going to give all of our viewers um, uh, a website, www.canadasupports.com, if you want to learn more about our, our regulatory uh, proposals that we'll be talking to Health Canada about, and also to find out how to support our campaign.
and uh, you go there, canadasupports.ca. And of course, you can also go to psychedelicassociation.net. And that's where you'll be able to find out information about our wonderful association and join. Um, now, there's another, yeah. Uh, this is a beautiful segue question actually from JJ Morse. There is already existing an already existing market for psychedelics used for, by tens of thousands of responsible people in Canada every week. We're very aware of that. Is there a self-sovereignty argument? May Jennifer laugh. There's, I don't know. Uh, there's always an argument, but uh and I, I'm, I, I'd like to speak first because I'm going to speak the least on this one. I, I, I just don't know the chance of it succeeding. I mean, there are some controlled substances where there's a pretty good argument for keeping them controlled and, and controlled substance law. Well, the unfortunate focus on the end user where it's often a mental health issue, uh, which is recognized in our laws one our policies public prosecutors are not supposed to see convictions where it's a simple possession charge that is not a suggestion or endorsement to be cavalier about you know being apprehended by law enforcement for possession of course uh because they're always er, the crown prosecutor is always free to exercise their discretion to pursue a conviction but you know that aside there there is some yeah, there there are some substances where their use and, and their proliferation does result in significant harms. And, and I don't think, I think it'd be very challenging to kind of argue that controlled substance law as a whole is inappropriate. Um, so I don't know, Robert, Jennifer, what, what do you think about like an argument that people are just allowed to? Well, this is where you and I will agree, and then I'll depart. Um, the, <laughs> the I agree there. Like you can't just say, "Oh, I'm I'm sovereign," because I have this this discussion with my First Nations clients, and it's like I have to point to those free men of the hills argument that it's like, you know, if you fit the profile that you never taken a library card, have lived in the woods, have never participated into the social system don't drive a vehicle right you could potentially succeed on some of those very airy fairy arguments but the context and the circumstances have to be there you can't pick and choose right and so i'll usually say to the first with these free men arguments i'll be like do you have a library card right and they're like yeah well, well too bad you've already you know you've committed to the system social contract too bad um but in the case of sovereign nations there's a lot of factors that have to line up. And so in theory, I think it's very possible, but the group in question will have to show effectively a list of circumstances, not just we woke up one morning and decided to sell weed, which, you know, again, if you could demonstrate, and I think this is where psilocybin or at least medicines that are grown in, in traditionally in, in our country, there could be an argument um, for that. The band in question, though, if to be a safe argument, would want to be able to demonstrate that they were engaged with these substances prior to contact. So if you're talking about cannabis on the Pacific Northwest, well, that didn't show up until the mid-70s because of draft dodgers. It's not indigenous like a number of psilocybin and psilocybin mushrooms. However, a group also has to be able to demonstrate that we maintain these traditions. I spoke to one band and they said, well, we didn't remember or write it down. And, and I'm like, well, then how will we be able to prove or show? And so, again, songs, traditions, words. And there are some groups in eastern Canada and Ontario, Quebec, that actually can demonstrate a history of cannabis and nation to nation trade right, in upper New York State and down into lower parts of the 13 colonies. However, not all bands can demonstrate that. The other side of the coin, though, is so what? If you don't, well, if band and council exercise their authority and say, you know what, federal government, fuck you. When you can figure out clean water on our reservation, right, and any of the other promises 
then maybe we'll start following your the laws. But many are seeing this, and certainly since the uncovering of the mass graves in Kamloops, if there was apprehension before about seizing the day, there isn't. And so this is ultimately where I what what I I, I love what we're talking about. But I think regardless of what we do, the path to this door is already here. It's already open. People are already doing a whole bunch of stuff. That's, again, I think we're going to end up seeing a tale of two cities. And what does that then mean for the average person in society beyond confusion? It just means, on one hand, access to these substances will be so regulated, very difficult, expensive, cumbersome like right out of the gate think about it right versus $40 bag of mushrooms a playlist on Spotify a blindfold and the multitude of folks who claim to be certified in one method or another of being able to hold space whether that's a therapist a clinician whatever the point is is that if the government doesn't get this balance right They'll be beaten to the punch six ways from Sunday, and then good luck trying to regulate something that you're not ahead of. And they learn they're learning this the hard way with cannabis to the point that they got to go back and scrap the cannabis act and figure out something more sensible. And again, all of these growing pains, I suspect, regardless of what's decided, you know, the, the psychedelics are going to have these growing pains, and there, there, there won't be any ifs, ands, or buts about it. Yeah, I, I think, think those, those no. are wise words, Rob. It's just to expect that, given the territory. Okay, who would like to go, David or Jennifer? I mean, you I mean, both have things to say. Um, so in terms of autonomy, well, going back to one comment that Rob said, in terms of self-government uh, in the band, I mean, I don't know what the agreements would be, but they certainly would have a stronger argument for uh, what regulations they want within their territory. Uh, however, um, documented use is really key. Uh, and it can be more recent, like with the Native American church. Uh, and uh, it, it, because we do have the Native American church here in Canada, and uh, it, uh, the peyote mushrooms, the peyote uh, cacti are um, imported or brought over and shared. Um, but the, the real question is, can some, can groups decide, uh, document appropriately that the psilocybin mushrooms have been used? It's just that people did not want to share that information. So, uh, because that has been an ongoing issue, this dealing of traditional medicines. So it's possible that mushrooms have been used. But people aren't talking about it and just starting to talk about it. So that's the first issue. And then the other issue is that um, I think there are strong constitutional challenges for medical and religious access. Um, so I, I we, and we may have to go there. But here's the thing. I agree with everything Jennifer and David have said, and that's very rare. Uh, but it, it's, you know, it's wonderful to see. But. Again, enforcement, right? I think where I've, I've lived this with cannabis, where I've represented a band where the RCMP rolled in, swept, took everything, and they didn't know the band was meeting with Bill Blair later that day in Vancouver, which was fantastic, um, saying, you know, the chief didn't skip a beat. It was give us our computers, give us our money, give us our cannabis. And let's see you try it again tomorrow, because the advice was they show up, surround the cars, and we'll have a standoff, right? This flex the muscles. And that, ultimately, when you get banned negotiator notes of the federal government, they do not know what to do. A lot of the law depends on consensus and submission, you know, very, very, very contrary to mandated vaccine program, but generally it, it requires consent. And, in, and, and, and and with the law, and well, you're seeing First Nations that are just saying, hey, you showed up and you took everything we had with the barrel of a gun. And some bands like the Haida claim not to have ever ceded their, um, their rights. NISCA, on the other hand, you know, you've only got to look in the four corners of the NISCA agreement to know the, light, the rights and the limits. 
And maybe they wouldn't be the best band. But the, the, pro the problem that you highlighted, and I'll try to eloquently sum up, is it's like a patch quilt or a blanket of patch quilt. Patches of, again, different degrees and different standards. But to get through that constitutional lock or that hole or that perfect case, someone will fit the bill. I mean, it, 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 I used to say to the bands that I work with on the prairies, like I, I, I've been officially regarded by many in those circles as a firekeeper, that they've shared traditions. And from northern Saskatchewan to Honduras, I mean, there is evidence of medicinal trade. And that's, that is no, I mean, these trade routes to just not stop at the 49th parallel, right? And that's where, again, I think that it's going to take a mix of academia and First Nations. And just to, to sum up on this one last point, I've been assisting the Scottish Psychedelic Association. I mean, my heritage is Scottish. And Scottish and the Highlands and the Lowlands were also ranchers. And so what... Cebu cattle, what grows on, you know, that psilocybin. And so been arguing, are there ways for Scotland and the Scottish under national identity, national traditions? I mean, if you can protect bullfighting in Spain under European, under European Union law as having cultural important significance and heritage, well, I think some of these natural medicine traditions of the Northern Isles and given the remoteness you may have better records because again, you may have better records. So I don't think this is something that can be just limited to Canada. I think it's something that Europe and South America, Africa, it's up to the world to investigate the true origins and relationships that we had with these plants prior to the last you know, 90 years of enlightenment by governments that, you know what? I don't think they're getting it right. I mean, look how badly cannabis was rolled out. Now blindsided with a pandemic and to varying degrees of success. I really think government will need to have the conversation about psychedelics, but they're not going to be as ready as other groups that are just seizing it. I don't know if you remember several years ago um, what, what we're talking about, and I am actually going to change direction slightly, but just to finish this off, what we're talking about is um, just the importance of the, our Indigenous culture and our Indigenous people and their traditional healing and medicines. And it reminds me of, um, do you remember John Walston Saul wrote a book like 10 years ago or something and basically said, Canada we're fucked and we need to go back to our roots and our roots are our indigenous people and all the answers are there. So I just want to underline that, underscore that and say, that's really, that's just what we have to do. We have to start listening, um, asking the right questions and listening and paying attention. Um, so I'm going to go off in a slightly different direction to uh, address some questions from last time. Um, and they're really pertinent for many of our members and many of our community, because as, as um, I uh, said, one of the earlier questions, there are many people working, uh, we say, underground, I hate that word, um, but they're not above ground anyway at the moment, uh, in a very therapeutic, very lots of integrity, very good way, working with people um, to help them with all their in a therapeutic way. Um, and um, so we've got some questions about that, that group of people, and, and I'd really love to hear what you have to say. The first one is, as a therapist, I'm curious about the legal ramifications of taking a harm reduction approach for clients, i.e. not providing the substance, but holding the space for a patient. What do you guys think about that? Uh, talk to your regulator. Find no, out. No, no, I think they might arrest question. you if you talk to your regulator. What do you mean? Uh, I mean, prioritize maintaining your professional license. If you're a psychotherapist, if you're anyone who has a license that can be taken away, you you should probably understand how your college would feel about that. Now, some would say that's painting a target on yourself, but I mean, I'm a lawyer. I'm a patent agent. I wouldn't want to gamble with my licenses if I were practicing in a way that could arguably get either of them revoked. So that's my main, the, the first thing I'd say to really consider if you're a therapist is, and then when I say therapist, I'm using that term very broad. 
a guidance counselor, a social worker, a psychotherapist, a physician, you know, whatever your healthcare practitioner designation is, just understand that your license can be suspended or revoked. And that's a completely separate issue of any criminal charges. Not a criminal lawyer won't really comment on the limits of how you can get in trouble by being in the same room as someone and agreeing to be there with them while they use a controlled substance. I'll defer to Rob maybe on that, but I uh, think about your license. And if you're not licensed, you know, regardless of the ethical or spiritual, uh, you know, support, sympathy, some people may feel for that, practicing a profession, if that's what you're doing, without a license can get you in a lot of trouble too. So those are considerations outside of criminal ones. Yeah, I was thinking about that question. And that's kind of how I was one just disclaimer here, none of this is legal advice, maybe it's education, but certainly closer to the entertainment side of the spectrum of anything that I'm presenting here. But no, it's I've been in a situation where I've represented psychologists and we they were you know I don't know how we did it but we were successful in that situation but the point is is that is the first thing that if you are practicing you know you have to be doing it almost at a degree that you know that you you effectively are transparent and meeting and exceeding the obligations because yeah, I know from personal experience when the law society investigates or there's issues or perceptions of how you may be seen as doing something I mean it's serious and uh, so that's advice but the issue that gets cloudy here is ultimately why why is anyone because what it comes down to is the guilty mind and so if it's like a one-off right you're trying to help your friend and so on right probably it's not going to be an issue but you start turning this into a more regular thing and start charging money and put up a website and drawing that sort of attention i mean yeah it probably will turn into a larger investigation because there's probably going to be issues of our taxes being paid or anyone's licenses or regulatory issues. And then it starts to get into those issues that prosecutors start liking, which is, is this scenario in the public interest? And so certainly a doctor who's, or someone claiming to be a doctor, right? Holding out that they are engaging in these uh, substances, whether it's harmless or not, you know, in that scenario, they probably would be like, you know, something should be done here. But really, it's, you know, down to possession for purposes of trafficking or distribution. And I think where a lot of this can be problematic for a prosecutor is if everyone is admitting, hey, this is for personal use and this is for reasons which are not against the, the 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 public interest then you know they'll probably look at it and say who cares but it's not usually that one-off scenario or the mm. game that clients like to play what if what if i do it this way well no i mean if you already know it's illegal and you're looking to try to do something to undermine the law or sidestep it well you're rolling the dice jennifer wants to weigh in Mute, muted, 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 Jennifer. Hi, sorry. Um, I'd like to first reiterate what Rob said, since we didn't say it at the beginning, that we are not providing legal advice, and this is for interest or educational purposes only. And my co comment is that um, I, I agree 100% with my colleagues. Um, I think that uh, it's a... Uh, Slippery slope to be advertising uh, uh, that they can be a trip sitter, so to speak. However, if a patient comes in to see their therapist and says, I have taken a psychedelic substance and I need help with processing my experience, um, I think as long as they're not advertising it and they're not putting it out there that that's what they're doing, but 
by just by somebody coming in to see them and saying, I need help. Mm -hmm. I, it, in my mind, it seems like that would be within their purview of, of skill. But here's if the they, thing. If they, if they okay. have training with helping people process it and their, um, their college is aware of the service that they're providing. So before See, the you go. One of the difficulties is I had a client a few years ago, and this is my wife. We look, look, look back at this years ago, but they wanted to introduce rally banana bagging or rally packing, which is effectively hooking yourself up to an IV bag with vitamins. I mean, you see it now in Vancouver. There's a couple IV clinics, but they wanted to do it mobile. Like they show up at the Vancouver club or a hotel or a house or, and they wanted a legal opinion on the legality of all that. And well, when you speak to the college of physicians and the college of nurses and the college, like I asked my wife early on in our relationship, like, well, what would the college think about something like that? She's like, oh, no, no way. But really what it, you know, comes down to is, you know, what's the college's position and are they opening floodgates or mitigating something that has yet to be regulated? And legally, there is a case that I think could save anyone's ass in this scenario. It's Bedford. And Bedford, I've mentioned on previous calls, but Bedford had to do with sex workers. And ultimately, there was an issue in the case of whether the accountants, bodyguards and drivers of a sex worker, you know, were breaking laws and so on. And in that, like, that's a very interesting case that I think everyone should reacquaint themselves with, because I think there's degrees of connection and degrees of involvement. But making that public health and public safety arguments, plus hey, if you're engaged in any good or service activity, taxes are payable. So again, engaging a bookkeeper, engaging an accountant, engaging a driver, uh, potentially bodyguard. I mean, at the end of the day, that is making a risky activity, one, compliant from the tax point of view, but from a health and safety side, um, you know, you may be able to win on a charter argument, as was in Bedford, of, that the activity in question somehow fell within life, liberty, and security of the person. But that's where commerce and uh, medical access sometimes are not um, reconcilable when it comes to presenting these types of cases. Nice precedent, Rob. Um, Jennifer, do you want to say something else? Because I have another question. Nope. Uh, um, I, well, I have an important point just, here, actually. Just that, just, oh, sorry. Just that they're, it's not just their college. It's their insurers, too. Uh, that uh, my, my important it's always point. Liability. Yes. But right. I tell people that's the least of your worries, insurance, or, uh, you know, in, when these things go sideways. I'd just like to uh, point out that nothing I'm seeing on this or on any webinar I've ever been on is legal advice. Please remind me if we do one of these again, which I do hope we do because they're so fascinating uh, to say that at the very beginning and maybe at the end too. So you don't have to, you know, halfway through say that. Very good point. I mean, the, the person asking that question did say though, like harm reduction, then you're not, the therapist isn't giving the client, the um, medicine, they're bringing it in themselves. How about that? But that that's, doesn't really make it. No, that obviously doesn't make a lot of difference. Well, if you want to okay. open your property up to civil forfeiture, right, where they just have to show in civil forfeiture versus criminal offenses, it's the civil standard, which is they only have to prove an unlawful act, not a criminal conviction. So if you're, you know, I'm Dr. Witch Doctor offering my shamanic guru services and throwing my legal profession into that um, out of this house. Well, it could be the case that, you know, a, to, to make an example, just as they did with bikers, civil forfeiture. So again, I just sort of look at it as what's the risk and why. And, um, and I mean, look, if you're so dedicated to providing people with medicine and helping, right, looking back at the legacy of Leo Ziff in the Bay Area in the late 60s, I mean, people do this. And there's a mantra and a, and, a, and a way about it. I mean, Janice Phelps at CIIS will say to you, psychedelic therapy is not about making money. And so, again, I don't think a lot of the folks at their heart are truly doing it 
is they're worrying about insurance. They're worrying about the law. For them, their metric, perhaps, of why they do it and how they're doing it and the impact they're making is how they measure what they're doing. And that, of course, is probably very different than how the government looks at these type of scenarios. But I think the sooner we can get government making these changes and looking at it seriously, the sooner we'll have any kind of realistic chance of answering these questions definitively. Another question from uh, last time, which uh, is on this topic. Uh, what is the current status of legal consequences in Canada for underground psychedelic use, sales, therapy of people actually getting arrested? No, um, I mean, it. people have, um, but it's not something that I think at this stage police are, and police unions and police forces are looking at or know about, right? I mean, they're not really going after that. Now, given the direction that we're heading with corporate interests and so on, oh, you had it all the time. You had the corporate companies literally ratting on black market companies. And I think that's just going to happen again. So you're going to sooner or later, it will be on someone's agenda. And I think, you know, the city of Vancouver in 18 months will have more, more mushroom dispensaries, but will it be until there's a hundred plus that the city decide to do something? And it'll be interesting. One thing I'd point out there, and, and this definitely goes to thinking about, how one would execute on this, what kind of due diligence or screening one would do, but a, a massive difference between providing some sort of therapeutic service with some connection to psychedelics uh, and, and simply selling someone controlled substances is that the person who's participating, it might not go well. Like, I think we all kind of have this default that, though these things are, you know, psychedelics are safe and they, you know, it's, it's always a good thing. But I think we've got to be really careful that that's coming from an audience of people who probably understand psychedelics, typically because of firsthand experience. And they sort of project that level of comfort with psychedelics onto those around them when they kind of think about their worldview it's really important to disabuse oneself of that perspective and remember that you're taking an enormous risk if you give psychedelics to somebody or or kind of agree to participate in therapy whether or not you know and they they kind of bring it themselves you know it just might not go well they, they might you might lose control of the person they might leave they might injure themselves you know like I don't think these things are common with people that have a lot of experience with psychedelics, but if you have a psychedelics naive person who's traumatized, especially if they're physically large and difficult to control, if, you know, if they kind of start becoming violent or, or, you know, unpredictable, I, I think you got to understand that the person who you're involving in this, they might call the police after because I've definitely, I'm aware of specific examples where it has not gone well and, and it didn't, you know, that, that wasn't good for anyone involved. So, and that goes to, you know, there's a difference between screening someone and looking at mental health conditions and really thinking it through, you know, as a professional and just deciding you're going to heal people. And, and I'm not, you know, disparaging or you know i'm casting zero value judgment it kind of sounds like i am but i'm not uh it's just something to consider right and like what are you welcoming into your life and your pro your professional or personal experience in trying to help people and and how can it go wrong jennifer any comments no i think they've said it all <laughs> one more on this um, and then we will, uh, well, actually, we're almost out of time. Um, what rights might a mental health patient have to access psychedelic medicine when nothing else has worked? 
you know, that kind of when you, well, that was how they let people into the NAMI trials for heroin assistance treatment was, if nothing else worked, then you, you, it seems, this person says, it seems criminal for a system to withhold medicine that is known to work. That's exactly what the special access program is specifically for. So again, once MDMA, like if they change it, then I think it's going to be realistic to get MDMA and psilocybin in the form of specific drug products through the special access program. And it'll be in those circumstances. Until then, I guess just an exemption. And by the way, someone asked about whether LSD or other drugs could end up being, you know, loosened restrictions around them, just like psilocybin. And, and there's nothing in the law that prevents that. But I think it's worth recognizing that there's a level of inherent safety in unregulated psilocybin mushrooms that is not inherently there with unregulated chemical compounds. You know, because of production standards, like you don't know what toxins or other, you know, residual solvents, byproducts of a process that was used to manufacture a synthetic chemical. And you also don't really know what the synthetic chemical is. I mean, even if someone hands you a certificate of analysis with the chemical, and some research chemical companies will do that, you're still just trusting that it actually matches. And there's a much higher likelihood that that information is correct if it's coming from a regulated source where if they put something out there that's not accurate, it's very easy for, you know, consequences to vest on them. If it's someone who's skirting or outside the law, I mean, at the end of the day, you're really just trusting that what this person's giving you is what it looks like. I often, though, look at what were people doing for six to 10,000 years prior to now, right? And so your Shabibo in the rainforest, right, is somehow able to negotiate and navigate these medicines. And up until the government decided to save us from ourselves in 1971, you know, people were engaging in these medicines with no problem. And so I look at it really from the point of view of what changed? Right. What changed to the point that we have the Food and Drug Regulation and the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, that that deck is so stacked. And so trying to have any kind of a poker game in a stacked deck is really going to lead to just the House winning every time. And that really, I think, is a nice way to sum up with our government is the House always wins. And so, again, access to these medicines were around well before any any type of government like we see of the modern day. So to me, I think there's a way that, well, do we need to have such restrictions when for millennia we, we didn't need them? That could be topic for legal pathways four. That's a great topic. How about you, Jennifer? Any comments? Just going back to uh, my suggestion that we need a distinction between traditional medicines and uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, and uh, if we don't have that distinction, uh, we continue to have our social justice issues uh, ongoing uh, in so many countries. Uh, and uh, the Section 56 really is our access point right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the SAP will be for the pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great for you. As another comment here, you need to know your source over regulation will continue uh, a black market, which, of course, it created it and it will uh, continue to thrive. Um, there was one more thing I just wanted I, to... Yes, I do want to point out, that there might be a little bit of a bias toward the illicit market, especially if you live in BC or, and, and I'm not making some joke there. The fact is there's a lot of great cannabis being grown outside the regulated market in British Columbia. And it's 
been that way forever. And but I, I, I live in Alberta. It's a lot less like that here. I bet it's even less like that in Manitoba. We got peyote. We got mushrooms. There you go. Um, but it, uh, I, I just think you know. I know a lot of people who wouldn't even consider buying illicit cannabis now that you can get what I'd call good quality cannabis for less than thirty dollars an eighth. And medium quality ounces for a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars. And especially with vape pens or other concentrates or edibles, there's kind of some good health and safety reasons to avoid unregulated products. Yeah, but that 20% tax though kind of puts most people off. I've bought I've bought a fantastic 510 cartridge for $18 in a store in the last few months. It's ridiculous. I mean, I've, I've spent $50 and gotten two different eights that are both, you know, very good cannabis that a year ago would have been $50 per eighth in the regulated market. So it's become so much more cost effective that I, I think, again, when you're overly comfortable with an established illicit market, because it's been there, because there's been no social consequence to it the whole time, like you're living in very select parts of Canada, I think it's easy to underestimate the allure of yeah, just a regulated store next to chapters that is a five minute drive from my house and I can use my credit card, you know, I, and I'm aware that there's websites that deliver and I know that, but like many people, I would be extremely worried about using my credit card with an illicit business. Yeah. And, and I think in psychedelics, especially when we consider that they're typically not used at the same volume and the same pace as cannabis. I mean, a lot of people, if they can access psilocybin medically through a regulated system for the handful of times they're going to use it therapeutically, if, if it is limited use, which I think with most people it is, I, I just see the, if a regulated market existed, the overwhelming majority of people who are actually working with a healthcare provider would use that market. Um, and, and, and I'd say with any other drug, there's all the more motivation to it because again, you see psilocybin mushrooms, you recognize them, you know what they are. Someone gives you a capsule or a tablet or a little piece of paper. You are taking a bit of a leap of faith, right? And, and I'm in the mid nineties. If you bought a little piece of paper, it was probably going to be LSD. I think there's a vice article that said that's true about a third of the time now. And, and some of those other drugs that will fit on a, a piece of paper, you know, you really try and high score it, you, you could end up in the hospital or dead. Whereas with LSD, you would just be getting what you're looking for. So I, I, I'm optimistic about cool. any sort of regulated option being a lot more attractive than an unregulated market. Jennifer? Yeah, no, I agree with David. Um, and uh, just as a comment, um, 20% of regulated cannabis now is destroyed due to overproduction, right? So prices are coming down. It, uh, we are sorting, working through our difficulties with the regulation, the act and regulations, uh, and it takes time. I, I know everybody wants something now. They want solutions now. Um, unfortunately, bureaucracy doesn't work now. <laughs> they work slowly and. Uh, it takes time for them to decide how they want the policy to roll out. Um, but, and look, what is it, three years on now? <laughs> it takes time for things to be sorted out. And, uh, but prices are coming down. Um, does that mean I don't want some of our lovely craft growers to be regulated? Absolutely. I really want to see them regulated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything from you, Rob? Last, last comments? Again, it's a tale of two cities, and sometimes I feel like I am beautifully positioned between both of them. And Maybe on the bridge. Well, I won't go that far, but um, it, 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 look, it's just, this isn't new, right? Mm -hmm. It's just new to an, an, a generation and a government that, is not quite ready to deal with it. And um, so again, I think, yeah, I agree with everything David and Jennifer have said on these points. 
Um, but ultimately, to plug Dana Larson and the get your drugs tested, uh, you know, anyone that is going to take any type of drug and acquire it off the street, there is a risk. Like, I don't want to be cavalier and make, you know, you think that it's just all fun loving hippies and everything's made with love. No, they're, we're dealing with a fentanyl crisis. And so, when I, you know, to give Dana and his team a real nod, what started as a community program of get getting you know, get your drugs tested dot ca started as effectively a, a a community initiative but because of the work they're doing and maybe this is just again a reflection of the the geo political the geo positioning of where we're located in that um in that uh they be they were granted emergency powers during the fentanyl crisis to keep doing what they're doing. And so to me, if anyone is going to engage in these medicines and you've been given something, get it tested. This is probably the best advice I could give you. And there are transparent, accessible, safe services for that. So there's no need to roll the dice or two bullet Russian roulette with these substances. Do it, do it safely. Yeah, but how many people are, have the opportunity to access to do something like that? Anyone, um, you literally <laughs> send your drugs to them. You can, and, you can send it to them if you yeah. really want to. If you, yeah, it's it's totally possible to do all of that. And Whatever your address, through. Jen, we'll send you stuff, and then you can send it to the get your drugs tested. <laughs> it's it's, for, for it's some actually people. get your drugs tested dot com. That's, that's, that, that is that anybody can do that. that. People are in a position to buy enough of whatever they want to get it tested first, right? I oh, think you need minuscule amounts. Like, okay. it's, yeah, no, it's really quite amazing what they've done. And it's hopefully something that maybe with the assistance of the CPA can be replicated yeah. throughout Canada because the fentanyl crisis knows no bound and the opioid crisis, unfortunately, know no boundaries within our country. So, um, on our website, uh, psychedelicassociation.net, we actually have resources listing places for harm reduction, which is drug testing uh, on the website. So please go there and check it out. Please go there and join as a member. Please uh, find out more about what else we're doing with canadasupports.com. Um, thank you, James and Elijah, for making this possible putting all the right plugs in the right places. Uh, thank you, Deanna, for just getting us here and getting us on uh, um, aligned and, uh, and knowing exactly what we're supposed to be doing. She wouldn't do it without her. 